that the universe began to exist. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we know this, but let me give you one just that I think might be the simplest for us to grasp here this evening. It involves something called the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, that means a system such that there is no energy and no mass that can come into it from the outside, that in a closed system, the amount of useful energy is constantly being used up. The amount of useful energy is constantly being used up. Um, for example, this, this, this would illustrate it, uh, uh, it's not an entirely accurate illustration, but it will do, I think, for our purposes. If you came in here and you saw a coffee cup sitting up here and you came up and touched the coffee cup and it was still warm, you would know that that coffee cup had not been sitting here for 50 years. As a matter of fact, you'd know the coffee cup had not been sitting here probably for more than 30 minutes. Now, why is that? Because if left to itself, the coffee cup is going to do what? Yeah, it's going to, it's going to cool off. It's going to use up all of its heat energy. And all that useful energy, that, that energy that could be used to do work, this is called, for those of you in science, this is called entropy, that this useful energy is going to dissipate and it's going to be used up. Now, the universe is like that coffee cup. As a matter of fact, in the Time Magazine article, it basically says that a day is going to come far into the future when all the pockets of heat in the universe are going to be entirely cold, that all of the sources of light in the universe are going to burn up and there will no longer be any light that's generated anywhere in the universe, and that the universe is going to slow down to, to where it will be quiescent or motionless, and that the universe will use up all of its heat energy, all of its light energy, and its motion. Now, do you see what this implies? If the universe is using up its heat and its light and its motion, and if the universe hasn't used that up yet, it follows that the universe has not been here forever. Because if the universe had had an infinite past, if it had been here forever, what would have already happened to the heat and the light and the motion? it would have already been used up. Since it hasn't been used up yet, that means the universe could only have been running out of energy for a finite period of time. And if this is the present moment right here, then back here is the past. That means there was a beginning to the whole show. And from that point on, the universe has been running out of energy. It is as though the universe, as one scientist put it, had the entropy or this useful energy put into it from the outside in the very beginning. Or as Ted Koppel said on Nightline once, it looks to me like bangs have bangers. <laughs> I think that's a reasonable thing to believe. Now, there's a lot more that can be said about this. But I can remember when I first became a Christian having a lot of non-Christians tell me that the universe has been here forever. It's always been here. You would say, well, who, who, caused the, who, who created the universe? The answer was nobody. Why? Because it's always been here. It never had a beginning. Well, that is not a reasonable thing to hold any longer because now we have good reason to think the universe has not been here forever, that it began to exist. And one piece of evidence for that is the scientific discovery made years ago about the second law of thermodynamics. Indeed, Lord Kelvin and some of the early discoverers of, the, of entropy were quick to draw the conclusion that the past had to be finite or else the universe would have already used up all of its energy. So the universe is like a, like a car with gasoline in it. It's using up its fuel, and since it hasn't used up its fuel, it couldn't have been running out of gas forever. Now, I may run, run out of gas before this is over with, ladies and gentlemen, but hopefully <laughs> the universe won't do that. All right, that's, 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 that's the first area of confirmation that science has lent support to belief in God, that the universe had a beginning. Here's a second piece of evidence that science has lent support to belief in God, 
that was persuasive to the atheist Anthony Flew. You know, Anthony Flew was probably the leading intellectual defender of atheism for something like 50, count them, 50 years. And no one would laugh at you if you said that he was the intellectual leader of the atheist movement for practically half a century. A few years back, he became a believer in God. He's not a Christian yet, but he now believes in God. And the piece of evidence that I'm about to give you was one of the pieces of evidence that was persuasive to him. I have a friend that I teach with who did his doctorate in philosophy at Oxford University. One day he was walking down a lecture hall uh, at Oxford, and he, and he walked past a door where a famous British uh, philosopher, Anthony Kenny, was lecturing. And Kenny was actually lecturing on this piece of evidence. And he heard Kenny, the famous atheist, say, frankly, I really don't know what to do with this evidence. This is tough for those of us who are atheists to deal with. And it's called the fine tuning of the universe. The fine tuning of the universe. What scientists have discovered is that there are a number of physical factors that if they were slightly larger or slightly smaller by a billionth or a millionth of a percentage point, no life could appear anywhere in the universe. Let me say that again. They've discovered a large number of physical factors such that if any one of them was a little larger or a little smaller on the order of a millionth and sometimes a billionth or more of a percentage point, there could be no life anywhere. Let me illustrate this. The charge on an electron. Scientists have been able to measure how much negative charge is on an electron. What they didn't know was that if that charge was just a little bit larger, or just a little bit smaller, there could be no living things anywhere in the universe. They've made the same discovery for the mass of a proton. They've made the same discovery for the, for the strength of gravity in the universe. If the strength of gravity were just a little teeny bit weaker, or just a little teeny bit stronger, there could be no living things that were biological in the universe. The same for the rate at which the galaxies are expanding away from one another. If it were a little bit slower or a little bit faster, there could be no living things anywhere in the universe. Now think of it like this. Suppose that you were able to walk into a room and you knew that this room was, miracle of miracles, a universe generator. That this room generated universes. And you went into the room, and you looked, and there was a panel with a whole 30 or 40 dials on, and each dial was about this big. And each dial was colored black and had about 5,000 settings, but there was one sliver of a setting that was colored red, and the other 4,999 settings were black. And you looked at all 30 or 40 of these dials, and you noticed that every single dial was set to red. And you also discovered that if any single one of those dials was in the black area, the universe that it generated would not be able to sustain life. It would only be if all of those dials were precisely set in the red area as opposed to the black area that life could be permissible in the universe that's going to be generated by this room. Now that is what we have discovered. We have discovered that life-permitting universes or universes that will allow life to be present in that universe require the numbers to be very, very delicately tuned and selected, such that if any one of them had been a little larger or a little smaller, you get no living things whatsoever anywhere in the universe. And as one British scientist said, it looks like the dice were rigged ahead of time. And I may be simplistic, but I say again, it looks like rigged dice need a... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
I feel a lot of love right now. <laughs> There's a third area where science has lent support to belief in God. And this involves the discovery of biological information. Biological information. The first piece of evidence I gave was the discovery that the universe began to exist. And as my evidence, I cited the second law of thermodynamics. The second piece of evidence that I gave from science was the discovery that these factors of nature are very precisely, delicately tuned and balanced so life could appear. The third factor, which I'm going to cover right now, is the discovery of biological information. How many of you saw the movie Contact? A number of you. It was a movie featuring Jodie Foster, and it was about SETI, S-E-T-I. Jodie Foster was a SETI researcher in that movie. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the Search for Intelligent Life in Outer Space. Now, um, you w would assume, and this would be a correct assumption, that if we were going to look for intelligent life in outer space, we would have to have some way of knowing when we, recognize, when we discovered it, would we not? Now, what scientists have done is they've drawn a distinction among three things. Randomness, simple order, and information. Now, let me illustrate. Suppose I had alphabet soup, and I tossed it up in the air, and I suppose that this alphabet soup had English letters and it had numbers in it, and it's scattered all over the podium here. And here was an upside down T, uh, a, a, a square root of minus one, uh, a, a, a T laying on its side, and a 3.5, and so on. This would be random. Now, if you want to tell the computer to generate a random sequence of letters, you would give the computer two instructions. Number one, select any letter, and number two, repeat. Do you notice how simple that is? How many instructions is that? It's only two, and notice that you would tell the computer to select a specific letter? No, to select any old letter and repeat. So randomness is nonspecific, and it's very simple. It's very simple to produce. Now contrast that with simple order. Suppose that I had 500 MEs in a row. M-E, 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 and so on. Now this is not random, is it? 